So I am going to go ahead and give us a brief introduction of who this wonderful author is, and then we'll get started. Oh, uh, I should say this is, um, we have our interpreter, Sarah. I can't see your last name, Sarah. <laughs> oh, Sarah Blackberg. There we go. Now I can see it. Thank you. And Rochelle is captioning our event today. So thank you both for being here. Okay, so Nalini Singh is the New York Times and internationally best-selling author of the Psy Changeling and Guild Hunter Paranormal series, as well as the Rock Kiss Contemporary series. Her books have been translated into more than 20 languages. Nalini was born in Fiji and raised in New Zealand and her extensive travel around the world has informed and inspired the writing of her novels. She lives in New Zealand and loves to connect with her readers online at nalinisingh.com, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Nalini, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to do this. So if it's okay, we're going to dive in with some questions. Most of them are going to be about the Psy Changeling uh, because I just love them so much and I want everyone in the world to read them. So where did the idea of the Psy come from? And with the Psy, the idea of silence. Was there a process with coming up with that world? Yeah, it's really interesting. I um, So I've always been interested in uh, the human mind and what we can do with it and things like telepathy and all of that. I I don't know if I've ever told this story, but when I was, I feel like I was um, 14 or something. Um, so for us, that's like, we call, we used to say fourth form. So really just starting high school, really just in the second year of high school. And we had to do some kind of science fair project. Um, and so everybody's doing these serious sort of like, you know, chemistry things and whatever. And I'm like, I'm going to do it on psychic abilities. And... <laughs> And I took it really seriously. Like I, um, I got those flashcards they used to test if people are, you know, can read your mind kind of thing. And then I, I tested all my friends and, and my, made my family do it. And, you know, I had the board in the middle and that's which card am I holding up and like super serious. And then I had, um, I think it's the poster board, you know, like when you have the three piece thing that you put up for your, for your, um, uh, your project so I did that and I had it all set up I had all the history and and the results of my experiments and everything and um I remember when the teachers came by I think the, I do remember they were just like like smiling because they're like I can't we can't believe you did this as your <laughs> project <laughs> obviously I did not win um but um I had a really interesting time doing it and I think people enjoyed the project in terms of what it was and so I've always had that interest in the back of my mind for a long time. And um, I just started thinking at one point, okay, what if we did have actual psychic abilities? Not just the little things that, you know, where we think, oh, maybe I, I can read your mind a little bit, whatever. What if we had full on psychic abilities, like telekinesis, telepathy? Um, what would that demand from us uh, mentally? And um, what if it drove us insane? You know where what would we do to survive and that was really the critical question because what would we do to survive if that was if our choice was go insane um with these abilities that we can't control that we have you know they're they're a part of us and um there there's not very many choices open uh, to people like that so um that's where the series began and um yeah I just went from that point love it i I love how when you talk about the history of silence, when you talk about those first families having to make those choices for their children, and obviously it's not something that we have to decide now, but you put such reality into making those difficult choices for what's going to be the best for your family, and it's just really interesting how you can make a fantasy series like that um, resonate for parents, so that was just... Um, so when you were writing the series, did you plan out the romantic partners at the beginning or did they develop over the course of your writing? Uh, they definitely developed over the course of my writing. I, I, tend to, I tend to have characters and then sometimes I think I know what I'm doing and that I know exactly who's going to end up with who. And there's one particular couple which I will never ever reveal. It's my secret to go to the grave with me. I had them all set up for a book and I was like, yep, these two are going to be together. 
I started the book, it was like a horrible fail. There was no chemistry at all. It was so flat. It was like, you know, the internet dating when you go and meet someone and it's like nothing, there's nothing there. Um, so it was these two and I was like, okay, then I guess, I guess this is wrong. Um, so I started again um, um, and the couple that ended up being in the book, you know, it was fantastic, you know, blazing chemistry, just brilliant. And so, yeah, with the, with the romances, I, in those relationships, I like to have the natural growth instead of saying, okay, I'm writing this series and this person's going to go with this person and this person is going to go with this person and, you know, so forth. I think that's more doable if it's quite a short series. So for example, if I was writing a trilogy within quite a sh small period of time, I could probably, you know, think up everything and be like okay boom 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 these couples are set up um but with the side changing series you know it's a long sprawling series there's a lot of characters and so I just have to go with the flow um because it's not only the romances it's also there's a big story arc and so sometimes I know a couple is meant to be together but it's not their time yet because their part in the overall story arc hasn't come to that point and I think the the biggest example of this um and I'm going to spoil it for people who maybe haven't read the first series but um well, I'll just say the first one of the characters is Caleb I knew I knew who Caleb was going to be in book two which is where he's first mentioned and you know his book is not until like I literally wrote it like 10 years later and so every so often it happens like that we're in our I know from the moment a character walks onto a page, but a lot of other times it's more like I get to know the characters along with readers. Like I'm writing them and then I'm like, oh, this is who they are. And I get to know them little by little and I get to see other pieces of their lives. And yeah, and that's, that's how I sometimes, I mean, Judd was a big surprise. He was not meant to be book three at all, at all. He was just not meant to be there, but he just, you know, he was there on the page and Brenna was like, yep, he's mine. And so I was like, okay, I guess, I guess I'm doing this. So, yeah. All right, I love how the mating bond actually exists in your book. So like, no, these characters are just going to be together. And you didn't know it, but Brenna did. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of Caleb, what did, how was writing a morality chain hero? Was that easier or or harder than a more traditional hero? Has that something you'd done before? Um, so just to make sure I understand and the readers understand too, Morella oh, sure. Chain is when, um, just, I don't actually use the term. So oh, I, okay, I I'm sorry. <laughs> so did you want to explain it? Sure. Uh, so the way I understand it, it's a, a morality chain hero is somebody who many other characters would consider to be the bad guy, but because they fall in love, they are able to be good. My one person explained it to me as the hero would sacrifice his love to save the world, but a morality chain hero would sacrifice the world to save his love. But of course, in this series, uh, she would not allow him to do that. He would, he would be like, no, that's not allowed. <laughs> Yeah, so I, yeah, he does fit the perfect definition for, for that. Yeah, I've always thought of him as grey. Um, from the moment he stepped on the page, he wasn't black and white. Um, he was always grey. And I think he was the first character, thinking back, that I wrote that, that is so morally grey. And I think another one actually in the series um, who has not been a romantic protagonist but has been there from the start is Nikita. Um, so she's she's not a, a morality chain type hero, or is she? I don't know. She, her story is still going. But both of them are very grey characters. Um, but with Caleb, and I'll just go back and say that they're both very interesting to write. Because even with Caleb, you know, he's had a story. He's had, you know, he is in love. Um, he That hasn't magically made him the white knight. He is still gray. Like there is still the capability inside him to destroy the world. Um, so, you know, let's let's hope nothing happens to Sahara. Um, <laughs> so, but like 
obviously we see the growth in him we see the changes in him it's that's part of the, the joy of writing a character like that there's so much complexity um and I don't think he's ever going to be anything but gray that is who he is um but that's also what makes him powerful and I don't mean in the sense of his telekinesis he understands the darkness um in a very deep sense and he understands the evil forces in the world because he is far closer to those than than maybe a very heroic hero. Um, so yeah, it's um I still am so fascinated by Caleb and he makes a big presence, he's a big presence in um Last Guard. Uh, and um and yeah, so he has a really interesting connection with the, the heroine of Last Guard. And I will be really interested to see how readers view um, how they interact and what they see in Kyle. Um, and why is it that these two actually can um, talk to each other in a way that Caleb maybe doesn't talk to a lot of people. So um, it was really fun to, to write him in this book, but also just to see his continuing development. Because in a sense, he has become the greatest statesman of this I race. Um, and yet he is this morally great character. And um, he is not the sort of person we would think of as being the one we would be championing. And yet we do, because despite all that has happened to him and despite everything, he has somehow found a way to make these empathic decisions, which, which yeah, I just, he is a cool character. I do like him a lot. Oh, he's I'm great. also scared of him, but oh, yeah. oh, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, you, I would imagine you don't know what he's going to do on the page sometimes. No, I literally don't. He comes on the page and he's very, I don't know if I can explain it. Like from a writer's perspective, um, you might think that we know we're all knowing, but really isn't like that. For me, it's a process of discovery. And with a character like Caleb, and Nikita, it's constantly a surprise. It's like, it, I don't know what these two are going to say or what's going to come out of their mouths or what action they're going to take at a particular point in time. And um, that's part of the joy of writing. You know, it's part of the joy of loving series because it gives me this this really long period to expand on characters. The, their, their stories don't end when their love story ends. You know, they, they continue to grow as people. Um, they continue to make decisions um, and continue to show new sides of their personalities. Uh, so you mentioned Nikita, and I understand if you can't answer this exactly, but is there a chance we might see a Nikita love story down the road? She, she's super interesting. Um, but the thing is, I don't think she could ever be like a heroine, as we think of it, in in like a, you know, like a romance. But I think we're gonna keep seeing her story through the books because she has changed incredibly. Yes. Um, she's either changed or we're seeing more of her um, from the start to now. Um, and so we're gonna keep seeing it, but I, I can't see her as like having a, just a, a, a romance story act in the way we think of it. It's hers is a little bit more it's jagged, you know, there's ups and downs, there's, there's massive disruptions and changes. And, um, but then again, you know, what do I know? Maybe one day, <laughs> or maybe 10 years later, she'll be like, yo, you know, I'm ready. <laughs> so, but until then, you know, we, we will, you know, she'll continue to play a part. And um, one of the more recent books, I love to interaction with um, memory from Wolf Rain, because it's just, it's basically like a stare down. And, um, and I just loved it because these two really strong women and they're just like, no, you blink first, basically. And it was fun. So I love I love having her character in the books and I love that she continues to be challenged and she continues to be faced with moral choices. Um, and each time she has to decide which way does she go? Does she go towards the light or the darkness? And um, yeah, so we'll see. Um, so did any of, so you talked about how you've had some characters that you thought were going to get together and maybe ended up with different couples. Were there characters 
that just turned out to be different, completely different personalities than you originally saw them when you were forming them? Um, it's interesting. A lot of the times I only get a glimpse of a character and, um, and so it's, it's always a voyage of discovery. I'm never quite sure who they are fully. And sometimes it's really hard to get to know a character. And that, that's actually part of their personality. So um, an example of this is Zara from Shards of Hope. And she is actually, she is a very closed in type of person. There's very few people she trusts to let in. And so it was the same for me as the writer trying to get to know her. It took like an entire first draft. So that's like 80,000 words or more just for me to get beneath the first layer of his skin and, you know, build that trust with the character. And yeah, so, so for me, in terms of characters, um, I might get a glimpse of them and I think, oh yeah, this is, that's, that's who they are. But I always know it's a very shallow glimpse at first glance. I, I have to dig deep, you know, I have to spend months with them uh, to get to the point where I can tell their story and have it be authentic. So can you talk a little bit about your writing process where you first get an idea for a story and how you get to that last line where you're like, yes, this is the story I want to tell? Okay, so it's a little bit different if I'm writing uh, the start of a series or a standalone compared to writing a book in the series. So with, I'll just talk about series because we're mostly talking about side changeling. So at this point in the series, I know a lot of characters. Like I've met them before, even if I haven't spent a whole book with them, I have met them. Um, I've caught a glimpse of them. And so I have some awareness of who they are. And so... I always, almost always begin with characters um, because like I said, the, the plot and the characters are so entwined, but even when I know where the plot's gonna go, the characters have to work, right? And so I, I begin with these people. Who are these people? And, and then I just go. So I do this thing where it's called a fast draft or a skeleton draft. And that's really just me telling myself the story. Like literally nobody ever sees this draft. Nobody else. Only me because it's it's completely bonkers. Okay. So I love that British word. I'm going to use it. It's completely bonkers. If you read it, you would say, does this woman even know how to write? Because oh. it's, it's just bananas. It's all over the place. Um, I don't write in chronological order always. I will write scenes as they come to me. So I have written the ending sometimes before. I've written the beginning and I'll write powerful scenes and I'll write, okay, something needs to explode here and just leave it. And um, so it's very much like a, I don't edit, obviously I take off my editor's hat at all. It's just literally tell me the story. I want to get right to the guts of it. I want the, the, the harsh of it, you know, the raw harsh of it. It's, it's unadorned. And um yeah, and then I just go. And quite often, by the time I get to the end of that draft, you should know my characters a lot better. And I, I have a much stronger idea of the plot. And then I start all over again. So I do multiple full drafts of a book. And, you know, if there are writers watching this who, who want some advice and are having trouble, I would really recommend just writing without trying to edit because I think one thing that stops a lot of people is trying to make it perfect at first go and nothing is perfect at first go that's that's what editing is for you know you can fix it but to have you know like Nora Roberts said you know you, you can fix a bad page you can't fix a blank page um, and I love that saying so much because you really you need material to work on so um, so yeah, that's how I work. I just, I just go, I do draft after draft after draft. And my second or third draft is usually, I print out the entire manuscript and I handwrite um, all my edits on it. I just find that the change from computer to handwriting just, um, just seems to open different pathways in my brain and I get a really deep edit that way. Um, and then I'll do a couple more passes um, on the computer. Um, 
And then, um, and one of the passes I do now this deep into a series is the continuity pass to make sure that all the things line up because that's one of the biggest things I love about reading series is when you find Easter eggs that have been put in place over multiple books. And I try to be really, really careful not to screw up and have something, you know, that, that isn't continued on. So like if there is an element that's been mentioned in a previous book, I wanna make sure that it makes sense where we are in time in this book. And so that can actually take a really long time with a big series because um, there's a lot of plot threads, there's a lot of characters. And so um, that's more a technical type edit I do at the end because um, I can write the book without doing most of that because it's in my head, the storyline. Um, so when I'm checking at the end, it's, it's more like the tiny, tiny details, like um, could be simple as distances or time zones or, um, yeah, just where someone's tattoo is like located exactly, you know, that kind of thing. But um, it matters, I think, especially because I might be writing the books a year apart, but a reader might be reading them back to back to back. So it has to flow. Um, yeah. Yes, as somebody who consumed them, I think in three months, like all together. Yes. So thank you. Uh, where do you, how do you keep track of that? How do you keep track of all of those details? Okay, so um, it's funny, when I first started, when I wrote Slave to Sensation, uh, and then I had to write Visions of Heat. So this was my first series. I, you know, I had written six Silhouette Desire novels before, which were all basically standalone. One was kind of linked, but it was just lightly linked, and I could remember all of that. But um, so I got to writing Visions of Heat, and I was like, hmm. I have to keep referring back to Slave to Sensation for what I said in that book. So I was like, this should be more like, this should be a sensible way to do this. And so I started off with a folder and I had, um, I had a page for each of the characters that have been mentioned. I gave them all birth dates um, because that makes it much, much easier to keep track of age and time. And I had all the, you know, the hair color and all of that. And um, then I had a page for each of the packs or clans or any group, the Psy Council, you know, had a page. Um, and then I had like territorial areas marked out and how long it took to get from one place to the other kind of thing. And um, so it was, it was a little folder and it was fine for about, I wanna say about the first six books and it worked. And then it just, just, it was too much information. And so I switched again um and again my sister helped me so my sister is uh, my assistant officially but at the time she was just helping me because she's nice like that <laughs> and um she helped set up this wiki it was a private wiki and it had all the details of all the characters and it was cross-referenced and was amazing the thing is i don't like to look at anything else while i'm writing like i turn off my internet I turn off any other program on my computer. It's literally like a page on my screen and that's all I see. And so I wasn't actually checking the wiki. I would just ask her stuff. <laughs> so, um, so what she does these days, um, she keeps the wiki and what she does is she makes me a manifesto <laughs> every time. And so what I say to her, I'm writing this character or I'm writing this group of characters, I need to know everything about them and then she'll just print me out the pages because I am old school and I need I really like the printed pages um so yeah we do that and also um the one thing um I do is keep electronic files of all my books because of the way I edit um sometimes I leave stuff on the cutting room floor but the information is still in my head so I need to always double check that the reader has the information I think they have mm. And um, the way my brain works is um, I can quite often remember the exact sentence where a piece of information is mentioned. So I can do a search for that sentence and I can find what I need. And so together, so having the wiki and having Ashwini um, putting information together for me and then having that triple check against the final files, um, that really helps with um, keeping things continuous. And um, yeah. Fingers crossed, 
can keep going. <laughs> That's amazing. That's uh, that's an incredible uh, process that you and your sister have come up with. Um, so when you hit, you, you've mentioned that you have the, you don't necessarily write in order. Is that how you work against hitting a writing wall? Or is there something else that you'll go to if you just get stuck in the story you're currently working on? Yeah, so that's one way to do it. I just write whatever comes to me and then I'm not stuck staring at a page thinking, why can't I go forward? Because sometimes I find when I come back to it, actually I didn't need to have that bridging scene to go to the next bit. It literally, you can just cut it. It doesn't need to be there. But the other thing I've realized is it's like I'm having, I'm having a really serious problem and not just like, not just a writer procrastinating problem <laughs> or just like a little little thing where I can't quite get the scene right I've realized that there's probably a problem with the book if I have a really serious problem and that's when I stop everything and I I look at the characters again I look at what I'm trying to do and I see if I've taken a wrong turn and in a couple of books actually I've gone to about page 100 stopped looked at it and decided I realized I took a wrong turn at the start and I started again. So I would rather do that than carry on with a book that I know is not working because I'm never going to hand that book in. I, I, I have to be really happy with a book to, to turn it in. And so I would rather just stop at a point where I'm like, okay, there's a problem. And I realize what the problem is because I found the times where I have taken that really wrong turn and I've written, you know, 30,000, 40,000 words and then start it again. It actually goes faster the second time around because I've figured it out. And so I don't think of them as wasted words. I think of them as just, I just took a detour on the way there and it allowed me more thinking time um, to get to that point. I think really lovely way to think of that. Um, so you talked about how the sigh were sort of uh, something that came to you um, from your interest in psychology, uh, was there any reason why particularly changelings in general and then the leopards and the wolves being the first ones that you wrote about that you really wanted to have that sort of world? Yeah, it was, um, so I can't actually tell you why I put these two together because it just kind of happened, but it might have been a case of destiny <laughs> but I do know I love shapeshifters so I loved reading shapeshifter books but that particular time when I before I write it, started writing Safety Sensation I had read a whole bunch in a row where nobody wanted to be a shapeshifter like it was a curse or it was just something horrible and um, they were always fighting against it and I thought it would be kind of cool to be a shapeshifter like I could I'd like to change into a wolf or something and go prowling in the forest. So I wanted to write, that's why I call them changelings um, and not shapeshifters because they are true changelings. They literally live in both skins and they're happy in both skins. And so um, that's where they came from. They came from my desire to, to read shapeshifters who were totally content being, you know, both sides of their self. Um, and everything in their lives was informed by that sense of their um, of their animal side and their human side. And um, yeah, so that's where that came from. And then it just, um, I think it just felt like a natural mingling when, because, you know, you've got the side with the ice and then you've got the fire of the changelings and it just, I don't know, just throw them together and see what happens. Boop. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so have you... Do you think you will, will there be stories that focus on any of the other um, other packs, like more falcon stories, or will we see any of the non-predator changelings being heavily featured in any stories? Uh, definitely the falcons. They, they were actually on my schedule. They, were, they should have already had a book, but um, then the bears came along and were like, no, it's going to be us instead. So, <laughs> so I went that way. Um, like I said, sometimes the characters just make the decisions and I follow. But um, yeah, the Falcons definitely. I I literally have written a scene for like, it's going to go in one of the books. Um, I wrote that years ago and it hasn't quite got to the point, but I think it's we're getting closer. 
And um, so for sure, that they are for sure going to come. In terms of the non-credit exchange, like, I haven't really thought about it because it's because of the plot line of the world. It's a lot of very sort of uh, the things that happen require quite aggressive changelings um, to deal with it. And so with a non-predator, it's like, how does that fit into the storyline? Like I never say no. I never say no because who knows, I might get a character that just jumps out at me and that's the one I, I write that story about. But at this stage, um, it's probably going to stay focused on the predatory changelings. So did you have to do, or did you do any research into wolves and leopards and falcons and, and sea creatures? Uh, I mean, Ocean Light just talks about so many of the different animals that I frankly never thought about before. Uh, what kind of thought, how do you, how do you make them so real in this paranormal world? Yeah, so I definitely do research. I do research on anything that's real even though this is a paranormal world, there are certain elements that are real. For example, um, the Sierra Nevada mountains, they exist, you know, they are a real thing. There are real weather patterns. Um, there is real structure to how the trees grow up the mountains and what grows at certain elevations. So all of that I researched because even though as a reader, a reader might not consciously notice those things as they're reading, it does help build the world more realistically and that's the same with um the animals that um the changelings you know shift into i need to make sure i get those correct though obviously because they are changeling there are certain factors that are altered because their human side um is also present you know so for example leopards are quite solitary um, a lot of the big big cats are but because they are also human they're kind of solitary-ish, you know, they still have their pack, but they live in um, eyries because um, they're climbers, you know, they can climb and, and, and they have their little eyries and they have their sort of alone time, even though they also have their, their pack where they're connected. And that's the human side connecting them. Whereas with the wolves, you know, wolves naturally in the wild do um, come together in packs. They are not as much solitary. And so with the wolves, you know, they live in the den because they're both sides of their nature, because humans are very social animals. You know, we might be introverts or we might be extroverts, but as a species, we are social. Like that's what we're built to be. And, um, or like that's the, the um, that's what's brought us to this point kind of thing, you know, that drive to be social. So both sides of the nature in the, in the wolves is, um, you see that in their den, you know, it's sort of, both sides come together and you see that even more in the bears because they're like boom but then again they change the humanity changes them because bears again can be quite solitary so there's all these things I actually think about a lot because it's like how would a species that is solitary by nature how would how would having humanity as part of their makeup how would that change them and and then you get the people who don't quite fit like um, even in the human world, you know, there are people who don't like to be social. Um, I am myself, I'm quite a hermit sometimes. <laughs> so it's like, how do these people fit into um, these, this world of the changelings where um, they live in a den? You know, what if you are quite a solitary wolf? Um, how would you live? And that kind of thing. So I really try and think um, in a deeper sense. And I try to think, in, in the terms of both the group and the individual, because the individual, and I think, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Uh, there's a novella where uh, a submissive leopard mates with a dominant wolf, and he's not comfortable living in, in the den. And so they have to find a, a place for him um, to be part of the world and part of her life without having to live in this den, which would basically drive him crazy. So yeah, so it's it's like that, thinking both in terms of the wider, wider world and in terms of who the individual is that fits into this world. Yeah. So what made you choose San Francisco and, and the Sierra Nevada area and then 
and then Russia and then and really any of the places, what made you pick those as your your settings? Um, I just saw a question, so I'll answer. Someone said, did I oh, make sure. a mistake? And it's a submissive, uh, submissive wolf and a dominant leopard. No, it's the other way around. It's a, it's a Felix and Desiree's novel. Um, Desiree is the dominant leopard. Um, oh, wait, did I get it right? Yes, she's the leopard. What did I just say? And he is the wolf. Do I have that right? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I'm confusing myself. But anyway, yes. Um, so what was I? Oh, yeah, the, the location. So when I was first writing Safety Sensation, I had actually spent a lot of time traveling through the US and specifically California. And so when I sat down to write, I knew I needed a really big um, area of space. So a lot of times people ask me, why didn't you set it in New Zealand? You know, because it's lovely and beautiful. It has all this natural stuff, but it's New Zealand is very small geographically speaking. And I was writing, particularly the Snow Dancer Wolves, they're meant to be this massive pack that is basically the most powerful in the world. And um, they needed to have the sprawling territory. So that was one of the things that was like an unnegotiable, had to be really big area of land. Um, and then I needed like natural phenomena like um, lakes and rivers and deserts and mountains. And, and you know, and I just traveled through California and I was like, wow, this place is kind of perfect. <laughs> and, um, and so it was serendipity. It just, it just worked. Um, in terms of other locations, um, in a way, it's been a flow on effect from the series because um, with the bears, we already knew they existed in Moscow because they'd been mentioned in previous books in the series. And I try and um, locate, doesn't always work, but I try and locate, if I can, animal species in the area where they would naturally exist. Obviously, they do move because there is, again, that human side. But for example, the bears, that, that particular bear species that makes up most of the, the clan is actually native to that region. And so sometimes it's things like that. Um, yeah, so, I, and in terms of Last Guard, um, having Pyle be in India, it just worked. It just was natural. Um, again, she had been man mentioned in a previous book and that's where she was from. And, you know, she was mentioned as like a, I think she's mentioned one line in one book. Um, and probably at the time, I just thought, okay, right on. But for some, and then she stuck in the back of my head and then she emerged fully formed as a character. So, and then Delhi is her home base. And so that's where we had to go. Um, oh, sorry, I, my questions moved. I apologize. Um, <laughs> So I know that you also write thrillers that are, yes. what is the, how, how is, is that process at all different than writing your romance series? Yeah, it is a little bit different. So with romances, as long as I have the couple, I can just go. I don't quite need to know anything else at that point. Sort of a vague idea of maybe the plot. But with the thrillers, I'm finding I need to know the answer to the thriller question. So my thrillers are not a series, they're each different. So I need to know um, who did it, if it's a who done it, or why did it, you know, if it's a why done it. So basically I need to answer that question um, before I start writing on a, on a book length basis. With my romances, I find I need to answer that question on a series basis. So, for example, the question asked at the beginning of the side changing series, the first arc was silence. You know, there is silence, you know, um, and basically what do we do with it? Like, where is this all going to go? And so I needed to know that before I started, the, you know, to, to strongly write that arc of the series. But on a book basis, I don't need to answer the question I can figure it out as I go with the thrillers each of them is standalone there's no series I so I need to answer that question on a book basis um, and I tend to also I find so both my ones that I've written my thrillers 
it tends to be a closed system. So one is a small town, the second is a cul-de-sac. And in a sense, they're both closed rooms, but just not rooms. And so I need to know all the players in the room. And so there's a little bit more work there, whereas with the paranormals, um, I quite often will meet people along the way um, and get to know them. Whereas with these ones, I'm more likely to already know the cast when I start writing. So in your bio, it mentions that you are a lawyer, you've been a librarian and a teacher, a candy factor general hand. Uh, has any of these, how have these influenced your writing? little it's like life you know leaves little little imprints on us as we go along um one of the books um so my i wrote a book a contemporary called rock hat that one there was had a lot of influence from my um not influence but information that i used in terms of the um what it's like to work in corporate law you know corporate firm of any kind you know what and I felt like that that knowledge I had from having worked in corporate law is like it really helped me color in these characters to be quite real um, in terms of their jobs and what they did but in general it's more a case of little pieces of information just randomly help me or quite often it's the people I met along the way because I've had such varied experiences I've met a lot of people and I think that's really, I think you said it at the start, you know, it's helped me color my world um, in Technicolor and particularly the years I spent working in Japan. So even though I was in a rural town, you know, um, not very many <laughs> foreigners there, um, part of our part of our mandate for the position was that we were also cultural ambassadors so we we're introducing you know our countries and helping people understand um, different parts of the world and just having fun with the kids as long um, along with teaching but the program also took graduates from around the world and so the times I spent with the people on in the program from other parts of the world were you know amazing I had friends all over the world um, because of this program, you know, uh, and also others I met um, during my travels around Asia. So I think it has really helped me be more aware of differences in a good way. So I know this is a funny conversation that I think often comes up online where people talk about things like taking off your shoes, you know, whether when you go into someone's houses and for some cultures you must. Like, it's so horribly rude not to take off your shoes. Um, and for other cultures, it's perfectly fine just to walk in, in your shoes and people think it's weird to take off your shoes. So because I've lived in different places and had these different job experiences and I'm just more aware that there is no one right way, that, it's, that there can be so much divergence. And I think that helps add depth to characterization, um, to worlds. Um, and to the overall story. And I will say that ch the chocolate addictions in my book may have been influenced by my candy factory days. Just saying. <laughs> I love that. Um, so if Netflix or HBO or somebody came to you tomorrow and said, hey, we need to make this into a show, do you have any actors that you just absolutely have pictured as the characters or are they just fully formed in your own head, not looking like anybody in particular? Yeah, they're fully formed in my own head. Um, so I have a, I have a friend who does um, like collages of her books. So each time she starts a book, she does a collage and she cuts out pictures of celebrities or just models from magazines. And it really helps her visualize the characters that she writes. Whereas me, um, the picture is built inside my head. So I'm very particular about how people look and I can be extremely picky <laughs> about what they might put on my cover sometimes because they're so vivid in my head. Um, but at the same time, I'm also aware that uh, TV or visual media is very different from like a novel. And so if someone came to me and said, hey, we're going to make this series, I am happy to look at, 
you know, options for characters because I know that they can't magically go inside my head yeah. and and get the right person. And so, and I also see, you know, readers quite often will tag me in their casting choices. Um, and it's amazing how many different types of um, actors or models uh, they'll choose for the same character. So I can see how different people can view it in a totally different way a single character and so yeah I'm I'm open I'm always like okay I just want someone if they ever did it I just want them to stay true to the heart of the character you know because that's the core um and also to di the diversity of the characters because the series is very diverse um and that's the one thing I've always said you know um I'm okay with casting choices as long as they hold to the diversity um, and, and have that, you know, on the screen. Yes. Um, so Nalini, if it's okay with you, uh, would you be, be okay if we did some participant questions, uh, for, to finish us yeah. off? Okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, what we have here is we've been set up so people can upvote them. So I'm going to be pulling from the ones at the top. Uh, so the first one is somebody wants to know if Silver's brother, which I am not going to remember his name all of a sudden. Alan. Oh, thank you. If he and that bear that was very flirty, if they might get a a either a novel or a short story at some point. They are actually in Las Gart. There's a there's a there's an excellent chunk about them. So why don't I get back to you after you've read the book? Because yeah. okay. <laughs> I think um, yeah, I, I I love these two, and I love it's kind of answered in the book as to. Um, the timeline for them. So I won't spoil it, but yeah, they're, they're adorable and they are in the book. Uh, somebody wanted to know if there will be any more short story collections to cover some of the smaller characters and their, and their stories. I think they're probably talking about like the novella collections like Wild Embrace and Wild Invitation. Um, you know, it's always possible. Uh, I do like writing novellas, but it's also difficult in a way because um, with writing novellas, I have to be conscious of not putting any series plot lines in them. So, because not everybody reads the novellas, um, and so if I put something really important to the series in a novella, it, um, it could be missed by a lot of people. And so uh, I have to find, uh, for novellas, I have to find stories that can be told basically um, in isolation almost from the sort of main overarching storyline and um, it also depends on uh, scheduling basically time sure uh, so yeah I mean I do enjoy novellas so it might happen but for the time being I'll probably just do the the free short stories I do for my newsletter subscribers um, I'll give that a little plug it's free to join I'm too lazy to spam you, so you'll get like one newsletter a year, except I think in December when we're like, we're taking the time off. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we do, uh, I do like a free short story. I try to do it multiple times a year. Um, again, it depends on uh, scheduling. I think last year I did, I didn't do one sort of regularly and then right at the end of the year, I did, I did like three in a, three in a single newsletter kind of thing. So it's, um, yeah, that's quite fun. That and that way I can check in on characters without having to, um, you know, um, do like a full book on them. Um, and the most recent one I did was um, Zara, who was mentioned in Slave to Sensation. So I did a three-part short story um, on Zara, and so yeah, you can read that for free. Just join the newsletter, and there's always a link to the previous newsletter and the current newsletter, so you can always click backwards. Um, and there's a downloadable ebook with the first set of short stories I did. And uh, Emma has put the link to Nalini's website in the chat and you'll be able to find the newsletter there. So if you haven't signed up for it, go do that. Uh, so we, somebody had asked, uh, re referencing earlier Nikita, um, if she'd have a story, but they also asked about if Anthony would ever have a love story. <laughs> it's a very sneaky question yes. <laughs> <laughs> um it's basically the same answer the thing with these two is um they have 
they have been born into silence. They have lived in silence for the entirety of their lives. And they're adults with adult children. So when you consider the length of their lives that they spent under silence, that has left a mark. And so any story either, both has, is always going to be over a super long period. I think that's, that's what I feel. I feel like for them, they're not part of this generation that's breaking out when they're, you know, in their 20s and 30s and they've got decades and decades and decades ahead of them. These people have already lived, um, according to the, the, the life um, experiences in the book, they've lived almost half their lives, you know, under this, this regime. And they were brought up by people who have lived total, the totality of their lives under that regime. So um, they're just in a different space than um, the characters who are having books now. But um, I'm really enjoying following their journey. So yeah, you'll see more of Anthony too. Do you have a timeline set up for how many books will be in this sort of second season of the Side Changeling world? Uh, no, I generally don't have a number of books. I tend to think more in terms of what's the storyline I want to tell um, in an arc. And then sometimes, you know, it might take, well, it took 15 books for the first one. <laughs> um, so, you know, it might take five this time or no, it won't take five because we're already at there. But, um, you know, it might take 10 or it might take eight. I'm not sure. It just depends on how many books it takes to get to the point I want to take us to. And then yeah, we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, somebody wanted to know if there'll be stories in the future with the children, like Ben, who, I mean, Ben is one of my favorites, so I appreciate that. Like, will we see Ben or, or even Kit? I mean, he's older, but will we see the juveniles featured in, um, in full stories? Um, so Kit is a likely because he is actually technically an adult now, mm -hmm. um, even though we've known him, you know, as, as a youth. Uh, because with the younger kids, the problem is to get to their stories includes a massive time jump. And I don't actually want to skip time that far ahead because I feel like the way the series plotline um, is moving, um, it wouldn't be natural to have that massive gap between books because so much would have changed um, in the political makeup of the world and everything else that's happening. So at this point in time, it just makes no sense to do that, that time jump. And of course, the other thing to be aware is if we jump time, then the other characters are going to age, you know, everyone else that we know. And so that's not, it's, it doesn't feel natural at this point to do it. Um, but who knows, you know, I intend to write this series forevermore. And so maybe when I'm, 80 who <laughs> will we'll have their books because story time moves differently from real world time um but yeah at this point you know the kids are going to get to be kids and i think it's going to be just as much fun watching them grow up um as opposed to jumping time and then having their books i would draw um, i love writing their scenes and i love seeing how they're developing as people um i love that ben is now a big brother and he's got this little sister that he just has to keep an eye on because she keeps getting in trouble. So, you know, that's another little facet of his personality. Um, yeah. Uh, somebody asked if we will ever find out what Malachi's animal is and um, from the, the, the Blackwater uh, group. Do we, yes. do we get to know that? Okay. Yep. All right, and then um, how about we're, we're almost reaching our hour point. If we did maybe two more questions, would that be okay? Yeah, yeah no worries. Okay, uh, let's see. This is from Guild Hunter, which I will admit I've only just started. So um, I will have no knowledge of the question I'm asking, but are Bluebell and Sparkle in the last book of the Guild Hunter series? Uh, is it the last book? Or that that's, the... what, that's what the question says, but again, I don't, um, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I think they're probably asking if it's the last book. Um, so uh, the, we're not at the last book yet. Okay. We're, we're, there's there's more books to come. So yeah, I'll tell you when it's the last book. Nobody ever believes me, but um, <laughs> I will actually tell you when it's the last book because I will be quite desperately sad as well. So you will all have to join me in my crying oh. and my tears. 
Um, but I was actually talking to my editor um, just the other day and talking about how I keep saying the series is going to end and then I have more stuff to, you know, explore in the series and more stories to tell. So, yeah, so, yeah, don't worry about it. Just put it out of your minds um, and, yeah, I'll make a big announcement if we get to that point. And I've always said the final book will be an Elena and Raphael book. It began with them and the series will end with them. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I feel like that's probably making a lot of people feel a little bit calmer, just in case. <laughs> Though I do want to, if people haven't gone and looked at the ridiculously beautiful cover for Archangel's Light that you shared uh, a few weeks ago, it's just stunning. So people should go it and is. It's beautiful. That. Yeah, and how they shot it and how they did the art for it is actually really brilliant. There's an article um, uh, that's linked to that. Um, and it's brilliant because he had to shoot the artist, Tony Marrow. He, he shot it um, during, you know, pandemic times. And so he had to find, he like literally found a model <laughs> in his gym. And they've, they've shot the reference images using um, like gym equipment, which I think is fabulous. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for our last one, we kind of touched on this before, but is there any chance that we might be able to see one of your stories on screen someday? Or at this point, should we just focus on reading all of the Nalini Singh books that we can? Um, at this point, you know, just read books. But um, there's, over the years, there have been, there's been interest um, in the series, both series and um, some of my other books as well. Um, there are a lot of people who are fans of the series, um, you know, in, in, Hollywood land or TV land. But the problem is that most of my books will probably require quite a big budget. Um, and I remember one time, one person who worked in finance and quite big budget films told me that for most TV shows, you know, the budget for like a episode, I would get like half a wing. So my angel could just fly in a circle <laughs> the whole time. Um, so yeah, so at this point, you know, we need someone with a really super big budget to come okay. in. Um, make one of these but uh, you know keep keep sending those vibes out into the universe and who knows maybe one day we'll we'll get to see it and uh, just thank you so much is there anything that you want to tease or share about the newer books that are coming out that people should be aware of or you want to just make us be on tender hooks until they can arrive no, i just i just hope you enjoy them um i loved writing um you know both last guard and archangel's light um I, I adore both books they're very different uh books you know because very different series but i i love all the characters and um yeah i hope you enjoy stepping into the side change the world in july and then the guild hunter world in october and um yeah that's it just yeah right. have fun all right Nalini, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your absolutely beautiful worlds with us and talking about them. Uh, it just, it's an absolute treat to be able to hear you talk about these books and these series. Uh, oh, thank so, you for having me here. Of course. It's been wonderful. <laughs>